Hi there. Chapter 8 of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. So this chapter begins in Mile City, Montana. The narrator is sitting alongside his motorcycle on a cool shady curbstone in the back of a hotel. The hotel they found there has several accoutrements, including beautiful cast iron bathtubs. And if you can imagine taking a nice bath after all that rough heat riding, uh, that would be a very nice thing, and it is for them. They're absolutely exhausted, and they wander around after their baths in town. Um, but, but they're happy to be together. They feel like a family. This chapter is going to allow us to understand motorcycle maintenance in a philosophical way. We will look at the way the motorcycle both maintenance and structures rational and how it exemplifies the now familiar classic romantic split but first let's look at it in a spiritual sense on this machine i've done the tuning so many times it's become a ritual the first tap it is right on no adjustment required so i move on to the next still plenty of time before the sun gets past those trees i always feel like i'm in church when i do this the gauge is some kind of religious icon, and I'm performing a holy rite with it. It is a member of a set called Precision Measuring Instruments, in which a classic sense has a profound meaning. So we now know the, the narrator is Phaedrus after shock therapy, and much of Phaedrus you know, has been gone, but some of his ideas are starting to push through. Phaedrus is very disdainful of reason, and here... Let's just say the narrator, a more, um, a more benign or more socially functional version of Phaedrus, is actually finding, um, finding the use of reason that, uh, that maybe we would, you know, find, um, seeing its utility in a way that maybe we would. Um, but of course, he's still got Phaedrus coming in, so his interpretation is quite intellectual. Not everyone understands what a completely rational process this is, this maintenance of a motorcycle. They think it's some kind of knack or some kind of affinity for machines in operation. They are right, but the knack is almost purely a process of reason, and most of the troubles are caused what, by what old-time radio men called a short between the earphones. So, are people who are more classical more intelligent? Is that what that means? Or is it two different kinds of intelligence? As a romantic, I'm inclined to think the latter. This is, a, this is complicated in a way because it means we're going to be looking at motorcycle maintenance as an analogy for the philosophical um, definition of the process of, of reasoning. But fortunately for us, Pearson will use this analogy to help us understand the concept um, as he adjusts the tappets on his motorcycle. And he'll walk us through, allowing us to bypass reading academic philosophy for the time being. But it also might inspire us to do so. And, and Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, really for reasons like this, did inspire a lot of people to pursue um, the originals. We start with, with the ongoing contrast between classic and romantic. We are at the classic romantic barrier now, where on one side we see a cycle as it appears immediately, and this is an important way of seeing it, and on the other side we begin to see it as a mechanic does in terms of underlying form, and this is an important way of seeing things too. These tools, for example, this wrench has a certain romantic beauty to it, but its purpose is always purely classical. It's designed to change the underlying form of the machine. Precision instruments allow you to get as close as you can uh, to perfection. You can't ever achieve perfection. You're aiming for it, but it gets you as close as possible. And as one gets close to perfection, miracles happen. You go flying across the countryside under a power that would be called magic if it wasn't so completely rational in every way. The narrator describes the motorcycle not as a disparate amalgam of parts, but as a structural pyramid of concepts. The structure of concepts is formally called a hierarchy and since ancient times has been a basic structure for all Western knowledge. Kingdoms, empires, churches, armies have all been structured into hierarchies. Modern businesses are so structured. Tables of contents of reference material are so structured. Mechanical assemblies, computer software, 
All scientific and te technical knowledge is so structured, so much so that in some fields such as biology, the hierarchy of king, uh, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species is almost an icon. Well, I think that this structure of hierarchy actually underlies everything. And if you look um, at the at the uh, at the Pejo Verveki video that goes into that also, so that means that hierarchy underlies inorganic, biological, um, societal, and intellectual. The narrator goes on to describe the motorcycle as a system containing, again, as we saw in the last chapter, compo components and functions. And the system is interrelated in great complexity. And like all systems, all systems are hierarchical. Now he relates these other systems to demonstrate how the, the system structure, which contains subsystems above, uh, the subsystems above, as well as causes and effects, which allow the subsystems to operate and that is the underlying nature of everything. Without seeing this underlying nature, say, um, in a factory system, it, it will seem to a worker that, that, the co that he is a cog in the system and that there is a man on top, and this man is often characterized as some kind of oppressor who is entrapping workers into meaningless tasks. And while there might be a dimension of that, there is no villain, no mean guy who wants them to live meaningless lives. It's just that the structure, the system demands it, and no one is willing to take on the formidable task of changing the structure just because it's meaningless. So while the system of the human being worker is perceiving his narrow function as meaningless, in the larger system of the factory, his role is critical for the functioning of the system. Hierarchy is what you call an archetype, and this is an archetype that exists on all levels, like I was just mentioning. Within the hierarchy of the philosophical description of motorcycle maintenance is also a transferable concept of this motorcycle hierarchy into society, like the, like the factory um, analogy that we just mentioned. But to tear down a factory or to revolt against a government or to avoid repair of a motorcycle because it is a system is to attack the effects rather than causes. And as long as the attack is upon effects only, no change is possible. The true system, the real system, is our present construction of systematic thought itself, rationality itself. And if a factory is torn down but the rationality it is left standing, then that rationality will simply produce another factory. If a revolution destroys a systematic government, but the systematic patterns of thought that produced that government are left intact, then those patterns will repeat themselves in the succeeding government. There's so much to talk about the system and so little understanding. And I think a big problem we're having now is we don't have a handle on reality in a lot of ways. We continue to attack effects, you know, attack the oppressor without understanding the causes or attack the opposing viewpoint, just attack. As long as we remain in this mindset, which invariably results in an us against them mentality, we're going to think that by revolting against the other side, we will be free. What happens, in fact, is that um, the revolutionaries be begin to inhabit the same systematic patterns which were left intact after the content that populated this pattern was destroyed after the revolution. And this explains why revolutionary movements uh, become the authoritarian that they vanquished. And we don't have to go far to see this. You see the authoritarian Soviet Union replaces the authoritarian Stalin. Um, the religious in our country, in the United States, the religious and socially conservative right is replaced by authoritarian identitarians. So piercing analogy is that the matter that, uh, that, that uh, motorcycles is comprised of, uh, steel, is, is the subject of the object of mind. I've noticed that people who have never worked with steel have trouble seeing this, that the motorcycle is primarily a mental phenomenon. Steel can be any shape you want if you are skilled enough, and any shape but the one you want if you are not. <sighs> Shapes like this, tappet, and remember this is all about adjusting the tappets, are what you arrive at, what you give the steel. Steel has no more shapes than this old pile of dirt on the engine here. These shapes are all out of someone's mind. That's important to see. The steel, hell, even the steel is out of someone's mind. There's no steel in nature. Anyone from the Bronze Age could have told you that. All nature has a potential for steel. There's nothing else there.
But what is potential? That's also in someone's mind. Ghosts. So remember the ghost speech in chapter 3? Does that make a little more sense now? Our mind is shaped by ghosts just like steel is shaped into motorcycle parts. That's really what Phaedrus was talking about when he said it was all in the mind. It sounds insane when you jump up and say it without reference to anything specific like an engine. So as the narrator guides us through his attempt to discern the problem about concerning the tappets, he realizes that at this point he just needs to stop and go by Bill's cycle shop. Bill is a mechanic who operates from the photographic mind school. That means his, his, his shop is completely cluttered and chaotic um, to the point of view of a bystander. But it's only the analytical knife of Bill's mind that can sort through this clutter. So another, another, another nice metaphor for exactly what we're talking about, the potential. Um, you have a void, a potential, and the analytical knife uh, makes categories out of it. This is a great town, John says. Really great. Surprised there are any like this left. I was looking all over this morning. They've got stockman's bars, high top boots, silver dollar belt buckles, Levi's, Stetsons, the whole thing, and it's real. <laughs> That's interesting because now these western towns, it's probably not real anymore. It's sort of just a, a tourist thing. But this is 1968, so it still was. Over Olympia beer, they muse on the way this western town is still very much intact. And... Um, and preserved. And again in Lila, you will see how important this Western mode of being fits into our identity as Americans, but that identity evolved from, from the land and from the people of the West who were there first, the Indians. So it's a little bit of a spoiler, but not really. That's going to be discussed in Lila. And like I said, I like to kind of um, relate the beginning of these ideas in Zam to what ends up um, being discussed in Lila. Something that ought to interest you, John says. They were talking in a bar about Bozeman, where we were going. They said the governor of Montana had a list of 50 radical college professors at the college in Bozeman he was going to fire. Then he got killed in a plane crash. So remember that. There are 50 radical professors, and we're going to get to know one of them pretty well. If they had 50 names, I say, mine must have been one. They both look at me with some surprise. This was a college, I tell them, where the wife of the President of the United States was actually banned because she was too controversial. Who? Eleanor Roosevelt. So radical is a relative thing, and certainly this is something we are seeing as we speak. Who is radical on YouTube, for example? So I hope that made sense, and I will see you next Sunday for Chapter 9.